Okay, so the recording has started. Just to um, introduce myself, I'm Tamsin Bradley. I'm Professor of International Development Studies at the University of um, Portsmouth. I've been PI on a number of research council um, projects, all of which have had a, a very central focus on gender um, and gender issues. But actually, the creation of this platform came from um, a partnership between two projects that were funded through what was then DFID's and ESRC's joint program on poverty um, alleviation. And to the two projects, you will hear uh, much more about um, the project that was focused particularly in Ethiopia later on um, this morning or this afternoon. But essentially, we came together to explore what we had done previously. My work was on um, gender-based violence related to climate change and displacement in Myanmar and Nepal. And Paul um, Hitchens and his colleague um, Abinet from WASH IRC Ethiopia um, were working on issues to do with WASH and mental well-being and happiness. And they, as I said, they will talk more about their work later on today. So we came together um, in order to apply for additional funding to really look at how we could generate or maximize our impact and how we could develop our networks um, together. And for us, really, gender was a really useful and important kind of thematic um, focus and emphasis. So we began to draw strands together and look forward in terms of how we could work to fill some of the really critical evidence um, gaps, particularly in relation to how different communities um, are responding and being impacted by um, climate change and environmental disaster caused by um, climate change. And taking a gendered understanding to understand, to reflecting on that is really critical because we know already that, that different groups of people are affected very differently and therefore the development response needs to be tailored to that. So that's kind of something of how we came um, together. And we were absolutely delighted and really lucky to also be able to extend our team to bring in Big Blue Communications that Sajid is one of the directors of, and he will talk a little bit more about the work they've done to develop this site um, shortly. But expanding our team has really enabled us to reach out and develop what we hope you will see is a really exciting, dynamic and interactive um, platform. The purpose of this platform is really to bring together practitioners with those of us who consider ourselves to be applied researchers who are ultimately very much focused and committed to achieving gender equality. Thankfully, those of us who believe research needs to have a practical focus are growing in uh, numbers. We used to be quite a strange breed of people, but um, now there's quite a growing community and relationships across the academic and practitioner divide are much more common and, um, and much more productive. So this site really is about cementing and taking further these relationships in a way that is mutually beneficial. We intend the platform to be open access. We intend to populate it with material that will be useful both to academics but also to um, practitioners. It will be interactive. We will hear later about the intentions for the site moving forward in terms of running a number of different webinar um, series, but also interactive in the sense of our um, blog and our podcasts and opportunities really to support and encourage dialogue, knowledge exchange, um, and to encourage also um, people in our network to see the platform as something that they can use for their own um, purposes in terms of sharing materials that they found useful, but also as a way of really promoting the excellent and important work that goes on within the field of um, gender and development. So you'll see, as Sajid takes you through the site, a number of materials that we've already developed. The site is in an early stage although it's advanced in terms of its infrastructure. So you will see the blog element. We have already a number of newsletters and we're connected to different so other social media platforms. 
We're also keen to develop um, online courses. We have one course in particular that's already um, up and running, but this is an area that we would like to uh, do more around. At the end of today, we really invite you, please, for your reflections, but also your comments in terms of what you would find useful um, on the platform, how you would like to see it um, developed. Ownership of gender focus, it has to be facilitated by a team, but we do not see ownership as lying with one particular institution. It really needs to develop and become, to use the term, a global um, good. It needs to be um, accessible and open. So those are my brief welcome and introductions. In terms of the programme for today, we will start with a tour of the site, a virtual tour of the site that Sajid will lead us um, through. We'll then move into a number of presentations focused on research projects that are quite well um, developed. You will see as you look at the site that there are there is space for different um, research projects that are ongoing. Um, already there is material there representing outputs from those research projects. So we thought today we would showcase three quite different um, projects from different parts of the world um, as a way of, of hopefully getting you excited and engaged in um, what more there is to come. We will then move to um, a session inviting a number of PhD students to share uh, their ongoing research. It's really important to us that Gender Focus is a platform that supports actually the next generation of applied um, researchers and that they feel that it's of use to them in terms of developing their profiles, but also supporting their networking across that academic and practitioner um, divide. So we'll be hearing um, from them. And then lastly, we will have a session at the end where we hopefully um, reflect on what we've had and also think about what is the way forward, what are the key um, activities and things that we should be uh, looking to focus on um, as we develop gender focus further. So I will stop there. As I've already said, please, any questions pop into the chat box. Um, I might need to designate a colleague to take charge of monitoring the chat box. John, can I put you in charge of that function? It's just difficult to see the chat box at the same time as move through slides. Um, so if I can put you in, in charge, that'd be great. Do that. I might, depending on what question comes up when, um intervene <laughs> with a question if it seems yeah. right or do yeah. you want questions held to the end of presentations uh yes the end of presentations but we'll have we'll have clear um question slots so most of the presentations and the sessions um are led today by members of the the core team so i will let them introduce themselves as we go through the the program and they have already introduced themselves in the in the chat box so let's move forward. Sajid, I'm gonna hand over to, to you. That's great, thanks Tamsin. Okay, hi everybody. Um, just for anyone who has not seen the uh, links that were posted in the chat window, um, I will just post those again. So these are just links to the Gender Focus website, which um, I encourage you to open up. There is an animation which uh, is a short two minute piece that explains what uh, Gender Focus is about. And then there's our LinkedIn, Twitter, and email newsletter. So um, please do open those up. Um, this presentation will take roughly um, 10 minutes. So um, firstly, thank you everyone for, for being with us. Uh, so my name is Sajid and uh, I'm a representative of a company called Big Blue Communications UK. And um, our team has been really fortunate to work with Tamsin and her amazing team on a range of activities over the last few months, including the development of the gender Focus website. So for the next few minutes, I'll take you through different parts um, of the site. I know that in the time slot um, for, for this particular section um, that there's a 30 minute um, uh, duration listed, but I, I think that this, this tour will take less than that, which means that then we have some more time for discussions and also for the other presentations too. So um, firstly, if you'd like to open up a separate browser, 
um, and explore the gender focus website while I speak. Um, that would be fantastic, but it's not necessary. Okay. I'm sure that um, everyone is capable of exploring uh, the site by themselves. So I I'll just give some brief guidance um, that, that may be useful as you explore the site. And, um, and then hopefully I'll answer the following questions, which is how can this site and its associated social media channels and email newsletter be useful for you? What kind of content will be published in future? And then how can you stay connected to the people behind Gender Focus? So um, I warmly invite you to follow those links that, that, were, uh, that were posted just a minute ago. Um, so these are all active accounts. So um, uh, please, if you're active on Twitter um, or on LinkedIn, please do feel free to, to follow those accounts and also engage with them. So, Anytime that you see some content that is um, exciting or useful or, or um, something that you enjoy, please do click like or share or comment uh, so that people in your own networks can also see that content too. And uh, that's important to us because two-way communication is very valuable and it helps us to improve the, the quality of the content that we, that we publish. So if you think that the content on this website and its other channels is good, please do recommend it to other people in your field. Um, so if on the homepage of the, of the website, um, there is a short uh, two minute animation embedded. So if, if you have a chance to watch that um, today, that would be um, excellent. So you can feel free to play it uh, now, even in the background um, on another browser while your Zoom account is, uh, is muted. It, it, that, that animation should actually give you a fairly good overview of everything that um, Gender Focus wants to achieve. And then just a little bit about um, the background to this site. So although um, today is day one for the site, um, the website actually has quite a long history. So you will actually see content on the website that dates back um, as early as 2016. And so that is because uh, this new website also incorporates content from an older website that was also managed by Tamsin and her team, and that was known as gendersouthasia.org. So the, the scope of, of work undertaken by the University of Portsmouth team and its, its partners has expanded uh, beyond South, South Asia since that website was set up. And so that's one reason why the, the new Gender Focus website has been, um, has been launched. Then in relation to the types of content that um, you can see uh, on the website, I'll just give a very quick one minute overview to that. So on the site, there are animation, there is blog posts, there are blog posts, there's video, and there are audio podcasts. Um, so so uh, as an example of the podcasts, uh, Tamsin was interviewed recently as part of a Life Solved audio podcast series by the University of Portsmouth. And so we published a blog post and a link to that podcast, which, um, which explores violence against women after crises. So it's a fascinating podcast and I warmly encourage you to, to listen to it um, or read its, its transcript. So there are actually some more podca uh, podcasts coming um, later this week. And then there's a series of them that are planned for the next few months as well. So, so the podcast concept is something that um, will actively be pushed on, uh, on this site, it's a great way to consume content. You can play podcasts from your computer or your phone in the background while you're doing work or exercise, it's, it's great. So um, also on the homepage um, in the blog section near the bottom, you can see uh, blog posts from the organization uh, IRC WASH in, uh, in Ethiopia. Uh, and you can also see another blog post written by three doctoral students um, about the links between the SDGs, which relate to gender equality and water and sanitation and hygiene. Uh, and then you can also see blog posts that highlight um, the stories told by citizen displacement narrators in Nepal and Myanmar. And so I'm, I'm just mentioning these as examples of the types of content um, that are gonna be published on the site. Um, it's just, just to highlight sort of the the exciting mix, um, and, and much of this has been captured quite recently. So uh, Tamsin and her team are, are consciously including uh, videos, animation, illustration, photography, and audio podcasts, because uh, we believe that's the type of content that can attract audiences, and then also generate conversation around um, important research issues. 
So that's just a short overview of the types of content that are on the site. And what I'll do now is I'll just do a, sh a short exploration of the individual uh, pages on, on the site. So at the top of the website, um, there's a navigation bar with, uh, with some hyperlinks. So on the about page, that's where you can read um, background information about, uh, about gender focus. And uh, th this text here is actually the same as the script for the, for the animation that is on the, on the homepage. Um, then to the right of that, there is a tab called projects. So if you roll your mouse over this tab, you'll see a drop down menu uh, that shows the names of projects that have been featured on this, this site so far. Um, so these are, these are projects that have been um, undertaken by the University of Portsmouth's International Development Group and its partners. And uh, so on these individual pages, you'll find uh, background information, photographs, video, and then animation where, where relevant. Um, then in the blog section, that's where we're featuring events, uh, newsletter articles, uh, uh, posts from guest, guest authors, and also links to podcasts. Um, so I warmly encourage you to, to visit this blog section over time, um, so we'll, because there will be quite a lot of content that's coming um, quite soon. So for the most part, this content that is available on our blog uh, section will be advertised through our Twitter account, our LinkedIn account, and email newsletters. So if, if you subscribe to those, then you'll get notifications um, when there's new content that has been published on the site. Uh, then the next tab is our online course section. So as, as Tamsin mentioned earlier, this is a free online course that um, was developed in response to data that was collected for an earlier project called Women Work and Violence, which focused on violence against women as an unintended outcome of uh, women's economic empowerment in, uh, in South Asia. And then the, the next tab, which is called resources, that's where you can find content uh, that has been published from, from the projects that are featured on this site. So you'll find videos, document downloads, fact sheets, and then also the profiles of individuals and organizations who are featured uh, on the site. So in, in this section, you will see content that is um, in some cases a few years old, and that's, that's because it's an archive of, uh, of knowledge that has been gathered over, over time on, on a lot of projects. So over the last, uh, roughly over the last five years. So that was just a, a short walkthrough of the main pages on the Gender Focus website. And before we just go to the next presentations, I'll just summarize um, this website, its channels, and then what, it, what are the plans for, for the future. So first, uh, this website is designed to work on your computer, on your laptop, uh, tablet, or mobile. So it is what's known as mobile responsive. So please visit it on whatever device is most convenient for you. It's been built for speed. Um, which means that you should be able to, even in a relatively low bandwidth area on your mobile phone, you should be able to consume the content fairly easily. Um, point two is the, the team that's behind uh, the Gender Focus website is consciously using digital content like podcasts and animation, uh, because we believe that's the type of content that, that will attract and engage audiences. Uh, third, please do follow our email newsletter, LinkedIn account, and Twitter account. Um, and please click like, comment, and share on uh, any good gender-focused content. And then fourth, lastly, please do let your peers uh, and your counterparts know about this new community and that it is here to seek uh, research collaborations and also to share knowledge on some really, really fascinating research projects. Um, so there we go. Yeah, thank you very much for your time. Um, this is a really exciting day. And um, I think I speak for all of my colleagues when I say at Big Blue, when I say that we're really, thrilled to be a part of it. So thank you. Thank you, Sajid. I'll just pause there for a moment in case there are um, any questions in relation to what, what people have heard. And I can't see the question, so I'm relying on John. <laughs> there are no questions at this point that I've picked up on or seen in the chat window, Tamsin. Okay, great, so let's move on. Um, so the next uh, session will focus on talking about a number of the projects that are profiled already on gender um, focus. So I'm going to hand over right now to Paul and Abinette, who are going to talk about their
project water security in Ethiopian emotional response of pastoralists. I can't see the rest of the title, weep. But I shall hand over to you, Paul. You'll do a better job than me. <laughs> Thank you, Tamsin. Hopefully you can all hear me. And I'm uh, delighted and honoured and slightly daunted to be the first presentation in the launch of uh, the Gender Focus website. So what I'm going to do in the next 10 minutes or so is present um, an overview of a project that, we, that was funded via an earlier ESRC DFID Development Frontiers uh, funding scheme and which then after that project was funded we teamed up with Tamsin to uh, do this follow-on work and to learn more about um, uh, gender and development which was an emerging concept um, and important feature of our, our work. So the project's called Water Security in Ethiopia and the Emotional Response of Pastoralists. Um, the acronym WEEP is uh, the shorthand. And I just want to make clear that the project was not explicitly focused on gender, but it became this um, important concept in our work and something we wanted to work on more going forward. And that's why we're really excited to be part of this network and learn from Tamsin and other colleagues about how to better incorporate gender within our our work. So the, the project was one that I led when I was based at Cranfield University, although I'm now based at the University of Leeds, and it involved a, a selection of partners, mostly um, actually NGOs rather than other universities. So the, the starting place for our project um, was really thinking about how to measure uh, water security for pastoralists. So there, oh yeah, sorry Tamsin, please next slide. Um, yeah. Um, there are over 200 million pastoralists worldwide, and um, there's, there, there's various difficulties in measuring um, water security or quality of water access for these communities. Most predominantly, it's due to their mobility that means that they're not tied to fixed infrastructure assets, which we often use to characterize uh, service levels within the, the water um, and broader wash sector. Also, um, particularly in the areas we were working in lowland Ethiopia, which we'll go on to contextualize a bit, there's um, very, a very diverse array of seasonal change in water points. So it's very hard to capture the kind of tapestry of water use in this context. And there's also the, the importance of animals um, as, as a kind of really important water um, user within this context. So we were left with the the state that conventional water indicators that focused on fixed households and fixed infrastructure were inappropriate and adapting those approaches to capture more more different water sources was difficult due to the the large rangelands that these communities uh, traveled through across across a year so we decided to take a kind of alternative approach which was to focus on the individual experiences of, of people living in these communities and see whether we could uh, develop a um, work around the concept of water related emotional well being. And this built on some work kind of at the interface between anthropology and psychology, looking at the importance of water for, for well being. Um, so we designed this project, but then in doing this, we realized we were moving the kind of unit of analysis of our water sector indicators from the household down to the individual. And in that sense, we were opening up the possibility to explore intra-household differences and particularly look at things like uh, gendered differences. Um, so that was uh, the logic. So next slide, please. Sorry. Um, so we, uh, this was actually a relatively short project. It was an 18th month. 18 month project where we were trying to deliver a kind of proof of concept of our approach. We followed a classic uh, mixed methods model where um, we were working, um, doing, well, I'll go on to explain the methodology shortly, but we work in, in Afar, Ethiopia, which is lowland Ethiopia. You can see on this map here that it's a, a state that goes out into the northeast of Ethiopia. It's lowland, it's very arid and pastoralist for the kind of main um, livelihood type, particularly in the rural areas. And so we worked just in three villages and the idea was to deliver um, research that went through a kind of mixed methods, inductive, designing indicator deductive cycle. So we did formative work in a number of villages doing uh, focus groups with um, men and women and interviews with vulnerable 
uh, individuals to explore um, livelihood patterns, uh, well-being in the communities and water use. And then through, and importantly, the idea of emotional well-being and the emotions that people are using to uh, describe their, their life and what is a good life and a bad life. And based on this work, we, we sought to devise a, an indicator that used a ranked emotional response and look to examine um, water security using it. And I'll go on to explain a little bit about the indicator. We then ran a, ran a survey uh, where we surveyed individuals, often paired men and women within households, so we could look at intra-household differences um, and collected our emotional uh, water-related wellbeing data. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, next Sorry, slide. Every, every now and again, it freezes. Okay, so the oh, next slide, oh, we're yeah. going to go on and talk uh, a little bit about our um, formative work. So the, the formative work involved uh, very various participatory activities um, within focus groups and within interviews, doing things like typical uh, day diaries of men and women within the communities, um, also doing things like participatory mapping. This uh, kind of reconfirmed something that is known about uh, these communities and our, our local partners knew very well that there's a very kind of patriarchal uh, societal system there. Uh, water management is a very gendered issue. Women are broadly responsible for domestic water, whilst men are responsible for uh, finding water for large animals, particularly uh, camels and goats, uh, adult goat, goats and cattle. And uh, we also started to explore uh, these ideas of emotion, mo uh, emotional response and can people connect emotions to water? And here's a couple of illustrative uh, quotes. So people talking about extreme worry uh, when they don't have enough water, children are crying at home and, and so forth, or, or, or feeling uh, extremely happy when, when there is water available in, in these communities. And if you're interested in more on the formative work, we've published a paper on this uh, in the link there. So we can go on to the next slide, please. So we, um, based on all that formative work, we mapped out the emotions that we've got ranked lists from our focus groups and, and mapped them onto a framework that ordered emotions by uh, two axes. One is um, the axes that runs from left to right, which is a measure of balance, which is a, a measure of emotional positivity or negativity, so happy and sad. The other one uh, was uh, the um, axes running uh, top to bottom, which is linked to arousal. Arousal is a description of emotion that is whether the emotion is linked to um, action or not. So, um, for example, anger is negative but is high arousal, whereas despair is negative but is low arousal. So we, we created a framework based on uh, emotions that were used in these emotional words used in these communities and developed a survey tool uh, effectively that we could include in a survey that had a number of statements. For example, how do you feel about your ability to cope during times of drought? And uh, then respondents were asked to, to tick different, uh, up to three emotions for that. And we had a set of um, questions related to water security. So ne next slide, please. So um, the main thrust of our work is really about, I'm based in the civil engineering department, um, although I'm actually a social scientist kind of working at the interface, a lot of our work was really around monitoring water. And we were looking at, for example, how did our emotional indicator compare to conventional measures? And this is just kind of one little example of the results. So in figure one, we have a uh, quantity of water, reported quantity of water collected in the dry and rainy season. Um, at the um, household level. And we can see that there's basically no statistical difference here. Um, there's very little differences. But when we ask people about their emotional uh, welfare around collecting, uh, um, collecting enough quantity for water in the different seasons, we see a massive divergence in our data. And, and so what we would suggest is that this subjective type indicator has additional analytical value for trying to explore Kind of what's going on and, and there's various things going on here but at one point it's because um, the labor intensity of collecting water in the dry season is a lot higher 
Um, there's also issues around the fact that the water collected in the dry season is shared with animals, whereas in the rainy season, animals uh, water themselves. So there's actually less water for human consumption, although people are collecting similar amounts. So then if we go on to the next slide, please. So then we started to think, OK, so we got quite excited at the start when we realised the potential of this kind of gendered analysis that we could do. And this is just uh, one graph displaying some results um, around um, emotional uh, response from men and women uh, around their overall water situation. Now, I've just highlighted the negative emotions picked out here. But essentially what this was showing us in our work was that the emotional response of men and women was very similar. And this was contrary to the hype the hypothesis that we developed once we realized this, because there's a lot of work in the wash sector that says women and men experience um, water insecurity very differently. And we suspected that women would have higher rates of emotional distress. Um, but we, we didn't find that in our work. So if we go to the next slide, please. So what was going on here? So in one point in this, um, in this context in afar, in these pastoralist communities, although it's very patriarchal, there's a really close mutual dependence, survival dependence between men and women. The, the, the water labor that the men do is necessary for survival, just as much as the water labor for the women. So we think perhaps there is actually, although there's kind of a, a patriarchal system, there is a kind of mutual dependence there. We also were working in a very homogenous area where there was really high rates of water insecurity. And so we think that there might be a threshold effect. So if we were gonna test our approach at higher levels of water security, we might start to see differences emerge between women and men. But the other thing could be that just our approach is not sensitive enough to, under, to detect gender differences. And this is why we want to be in this network so we can learn, actually, are we being really crude in approaching this question? Are there things that people in this network can help us uh, learn to adapt our approach? Um, so next slide, please, Tamsin. So just to outline next steps. So we still um, need to go back and do some of the more um, specific survey analysis. We've published papers on our formative work and some related work on risk assessments, which I notice a PhD student is on this call. Uh, so hi, Lucy. Um, but we need to look at uh, how we analyze our emotional data. We've got different ways of doing it, but I don't have time to go on here, but it's in here. We're actually going to conduct a further study with IRC Ethiopia and the University of Colorado Boulder to test this approach and other approaches to measuring individual water security across a, a, a larger gradient of water security context in afar. So going from urban, peri-urban into the rural areas and into the very water insecure areas where we were working. And we hope to be able to understand gender differences a bit more there. Um, and final next slide, please. Um, so just to say that we're kind of excited to be part of this. I feel uh, slightly we were a interesting choice of first presentation because we're really here to learn about gendered approaches. Um, but it's an example of the type of work where I think collaboration in this network could really benefit us. Here's a couple of our papers that we've um, published from our work. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact me on email or, or Twitter. OK, that's uh, it from me. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Um, we're doing well for time, so I invite um, any questions. I, I certainly have a few questions, um, but I'll step back for now. John, are you able to see? Oh, Louis's got a question. I can see your hand, Louis. Sorry, that was just a clap. That wasn't a hand. Was... Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's, no, there's no questions currently in the chat box, um, so I suggest people who uh, want to ask a question, either dive in or put up their hand if they're in a queue, and we can go through them that way. Okay, well, I'll dive in then. <clears throat> uh, Paul, it's a quite, I know we've had this question amongst the kind of team, but I just think it's really, um, really critical and we, in terms of moving forward is this issue of translatability and language and how we talk about emotion and how we talk about uh, mental health and well-being across um, different really complex um, context because we know the kind of mental health discourse uh, originates within kind of western a biomedical um, model so really I suppose that's my question is how did you go about developing um, your framework how did you go about identifying the specific 
words or terms that would allow you to get at an understanding of um, well-being, but also it's the connection between well-being and then issues of mental mental health. Yeah, so um, yeah, no, it's a really interesting question. So effectively, our approach was to try and be um, very inductive um, and the exploration of emotion and the development of that um, double axis framework, that really was generated through uh, focus groups, participatory listing, and emotions are really hard to explore. So what we ended up doing was doing things like asking people to um, act out <laughs> their, their body language, how they feel with these different emotions. We were also working in a FAR, which is a low resource language. So even in, um, Ethiopia, there's not always lots of material available in the in the Afar, Afari language. So that was that was um, one thing we did. We also once we our formative research was actually split over two stages. So we actually proposed the framework and the rankings and then went back a second time and did more focus groups to uh, to explore and refine it. But I would say it's that so that so that's one thing to say on the other hand there are reportedly established cross-cultural measures of things like depression um and other, other mental health um areas we were careful not to uh, move into anything that was around kind of clinical or even subclinical um labeling partly because we are not uh, clinically qualified to make those decisions, but also because of the cross-cultural context and the just real worry that, um, yeah, that these these so-called cross-cultural measures might not actually be applicable in this very uh, distinct area. Um, yeah, so that's what I'd say to that. Great, thank you. Um, John, do we have any other questions in the chat? I just have a follow-up. Uh, we don't currently, so do follow up, and I'm um, going to encourage other questions while you're following up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, John. Um, I mean, just as, I mean, we know that this is an, a really under-researched um, area, and mental health in particular is an area that is hugely stigmatizing, so it's, it's really difficult to get to it. So understanding it or using well-being as a way or a route into really exploring issues of mental health is, uh, is really critical, I feel. But I, I mean, I don't, well, I'm not entirely sure that there's an answer to this question, but I think in terms of gaps, we really know much less about um, how issues of well-being, mental health in times of disaster impact differently on men and women, how their emotional responses may be different and in turn how those emotional responses may be constructed by notions of, um, of gender. So I don't know if you've got any. Well, I've got a, a, just a, a brief reflection is that we, one of the reasons we were interested in this measure of arousal, so excitement of emotion is because we are interested. We know that water insecurity can be connected to violence both at a uh, intra-community level within, um, the, within this area of Ethiopia, not normally within Afari, but where the Afari clans intersect with other um, clan and tribal groups. Where there is, and so we were interested whether there was a link between um, very high excitement, negative emotions like anger and water insecurity, because we thought we could look at that. But then subsequently through engagement with the network of UTAMSON, I'm more and more interested actually that we were looking at the wrong um, area and that actually looking at whether we can identify a trigger emotions for gender-based violence would be a more um, potential kind of fruitful is the wrong word, but a new, a new avenue of thinking about. So um, yeah, and then, and then gendered uh, differences are really, really important in that space. So we can, we can say, watch this space. <laughs> There's going to be got, more. Yes, John. Uh, we have now got a question uh, from Yamuna Gale uh, from NCCR Nepal. 
Uh, so it's great to meet you, Yamuna. Uh, I'll read it out and then do feel free to dive in if you want to add. Um, so dealing with emotions is quite a sensitive issue. Sometimes the enumerators can face situation of anger to deal with and sometimes can burn out themselves. How do the enumerators working, uh, how are the enumerators working with the locals trained and supported? So I'm happy to answer that, but I wonder if Abinet um, is on the call, whether Abinet you'd like to reflect on that. Okay, thank you, Paul. Uh, I think, you know, uh, the enumerator selection process uh, was from the very beginning uh, up to the final stage. I mean, the enumerators were also involved in this process, you know, the ones we have been using for formative stage uh, were the ones we also use uh, for the survey process. So it's like they were also part of a team so that uh, we were uh, enhancing and building their uh, capacity and uh, uh, skills as well because we are also learning you know uh, from the different phases of the activity different things uh, likewise the enumerators were learning in addition to that all the enumerators were selected from the local area and are well equipped with the local language and with the culture so they have you know better understanding of the community even beyond the core research team members so that has been uh, one advantage uh, i think uh, that is how we try to manage otherwise as you mentioned you know uh, <clears throat> we are asking them you know to provide responses on recall basis like when we were doing the survey it was dry season but we were asking question about the wet season as well. So this might be like, uh, it create, you know, uh, redundance of questions or something like that one. So uh, you need to take care of, uh, you know, highly qualified enumerators who know the culture as well as the terminologies and the context very well. I think in this way, uh, at least we can minimize, you know, the bias. Thank you. Um, before we go on to the next question, uh, Yamuna, did, uh, did you want to um, follow up at all or are you happy with that answer? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I, I really appreciate uh, the response. So only my concern uh, from my experience is that sometimes the enumerators who are uh, more emotional than others can burn out themselves when seeing that situation. So sometimes there might be a need of uh, backstopping support for counseling later on uh, from the institutional side. That's where my point is, because you shouldn't be burned out out of that uh, situation, conversation, and the implications or impacts of that kind of crisis at individual level. So there should be a kind of maybe a backup uh, support for them on psycho social counseling when they need it. So that, that really helps. That's my experience in Nepal, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, we now have a question from uh, Elizabeth from the Community for Social Change and Development in India. Um, she comments that mental health uh, is a deep issue uh, and many times we just scratch the surface of it. Um, so she asks, in what situation should we intervene at the community level, um, as it is very individual centric as well? Um, does an individual realise how deep the problem is? Um, Paul or Abinette, do you want to comment on that? So, no, we agree. And it the... Focusing on um, emotional response, emotional well-being, and then thinking about the intersection with mental health is a ethically um, difficult area to work in. And and you know, I I hope we did it sensitively, but there these questions are kind of raising some of the risks because we're we what we're actually interested in do is can we develop tools and techniques that our partners like Oxfam, IRC can use in their programs. 
as what we call subjective indicators to complement objective indicators to basically check there's not something going on that they don't realize is going on in these communities, which means that their projects are actually causing harm. And so in that sense, we're, we're trying to work at that space of emotional wealth, well-being, emotional welfare, but we're doing it at a, a reasonably surface level, but we hope uh, sophisticatedly enough to, to capture kind of what is going on. Um, what what we, um, I mean, when should we intervene on an individual level? I mean, anyone that's doing large scale surveys should have some kind of protocol for when there is um, kind of harm or risks being reported or they witness something in the, at the household level. So I think there's a kind of procedural thing around how you manage work that has questions in it that can um, lead to sensitive issues emerging. Um, but uh, yeah, as said, we were kind of interested in that space before really mental health. So we did make the point that what we actually saw in these communities were communities living under a state of environmental change and broader development, which is eroding their ability to live it, their way of life. And there's actually a whole literature around trauma, around what is sometimes called indigenous communities, um, basically losing their world and becoming subsumed into um, modern states. And, and there is a lot of trauma and, and harm around that process. So we were intersecting with these issues. Um, I don't think we have a, an answer completely when we should have intervened or not, but um, yeah, I, I, it's interesting to see where these questions are coming from. Uh, Abinette, do you have anything to add? No, no, Paul. Actually, I, can I just jump in? Because it's just, it's really just brought something to mind, Paul. Um, the questions are really important questions. And I think working on these really sensitive um, issues raises or emphasizes the importance of ethics and also safeguarding. And I'm wondering um, on the gender focused site if we can't actually create a a space that shares good practice around researching on difficult um, topics, because I know it's something um, that I've been grappling with on, on many of my projects, particularly a current project at the moment in South Sudan, working with um, young girls. Um, so yeah, that's just come to mind as something that we can take, take forward. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely, you know, this is why we're really excited to be part of this network, because there's certainly a lot we, would like to learn from Elizabeth, from others who are asking these questions that are, you know, and, and how to do um, safe and ethical work on what we think are important issues is, is really important. Um, so I, yeah, I would in, be enthusiastic about that, Tamsin. Great. Can I just uh, go back to Elizabeth and ask if she wants to comment or are you happy with what you've heard so far? Uh, if I can say, uh... Uh, from the perspective of uh, what kind of research that you have gone through and uh, how you have assessed it, uh, it's okay with fine for me because like uh, this is something that uh, working in a very sensitive uh, in gender-based violence context where uh, we have seen that people uh, uh, like as a community, even they have having these issues, but they are not able to come out or they are not, they are I think we might just have um, lost the audio with you, Elizabeth. Can anyone else hear or is it uh, no. just... Right. Okay. Well, uh, maybe if we can get back um, to Elizabeth later, we will do. Um, there are no other questions in the chat window, Tamsin. Um, how would you like to proceed? So let's uh, move to the, the next project presentation, but just to really thank Paul and Abinette for a really uh, fascinating opening um, presentation. Also just to flag that there will be a podcast um, based on their research uh, coming very soon on gender focus. Um, and there's already blog posts as well um, detailing the work. So please um, follow up. Okay, so I will move on.
just bear with me. Slight frozen screen issue. <laughs> Fabulous. Right, I might need to stop sharing and share again. Okay. Right there, brilliant. Okay, so we move now, I take you from Ethiopia to uh, South Sudan. Um, and I'd like to welcome my um, colleagues who are um, in Juba. They sent me a picture of themselves all together with us on a big screen. So it's really exciting that they've been able to, um, to join us. Um, so the project that we are going to share with you today is a project that was funded by the British um, Academy, looking at the links between art, heritage and concepts of dignity and resilience within the humanitarian um, crisis in uh, South Sudan. So South Sudan is an incredibly artistically diverse country, both linguistically, ethnically, but also in terms of the array of different um, forms of art. So um, our project really was committed or is still committed to trying to collect and catalog and archive um, this diversity and to, to analyze it in the sense of what does it tell us um, about issues of identity and obviously cultural um, heritage and link to, to land, but also what, what can it tell us about how people cope with deep shock um, and trauma and ongoing crises and analyzing what came through using a gendered perspective was really um, critical because it enabled us to unpack and understand again the differences in how groups of people um, respond. So we at the University of Portsmouth had the pleasure of partnering with the Likakiri Collective which is an arts-based organization based in um, Juba, and I'm very shortly going to hand over to Likakiri's director, um, Atem Benny, who will talk a little bit more about the innovative um, approach to data collection that actually combines art with, a, with qualitative um, data collection insights. Um, but I just wanted to share um, first a, a quote that came from our data collection. And it, it's a quote that came actually from one of our female artists who we uh, interviewed, who focused on, on making embroidered, embroidering bread sheets. The embroidery of bread sheets um, is really a, a very uh, important and popular form of art for women um, in South Sudan. And it's a, a means of making a lot of money. We'll come, come back to it later on in our presentation. But in this quote that, um, have, that really you get a sense for of how important this art form is, but also how the beauty of what's created offers women a means of escapism. It also offers a means of coming together and sharing the art form with other women. It also enables um, a, a form of resilience around really projecting forward to the things that you find beautiful rather than um, having to just sit in the destruction of what is around you in a conflict um, setting. So there's many different levels in which art is critical to people's um, lives in South Sudan. And this really was the focus for our project. And we wanted to set what we discovered um, apart or compare it, if you like, to the way in which the humanitarian community and industry, um, to use that term, um, approaches issues of resilience, which is in a very kind of scientific and very limited way, focusing uh, largely on the kind of technical aspects of, of food security um, and house building and so on, which of, of course are important things, but actually resilience through our um, research came to mean far much more than that. And it links quite nicely with the first presentation, looking at issues of well-being and mental health, you know, art and, and celebrating its diversity has a really important psychological um, function. So I'm going to stop there and uh, invite 
um, attempt to introduce the approach that we took called Story Circles. This is an approach that the Liquor Curie Collective um, have developed. Um, we are going to shortly play a, a film, because Atem is also a film uh, maker that he has produced that really uh, showcases uh, storytelling as an approach and gives some reflections from those that took part in the research process. So Atem, I'm gonna hand over um, to you before we play the film, just so you can say a little bit more. Okay, thank you, and thank you all for the what you are doing. Uh, I think the more the most important thing was the sort of the response on that. Uh, we can't hear you very well, Atem. Can you get closer to your microphone? Can you hear me now, Mr. It's a little bit better. A little bit. Can you can you hear us? I can hear you better, Rebecca. I don't know where you're sat. It seems to be better. What about now? Yes. Hello. Hi, Tam. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, good. I said that the, the, the thank you for for this nice presentation, but thank you for all all of you who came to this uh, launching. And uh, the sort of circle, sort of, I think that this uh, this uh, this approach being initiated by this project, it was very uh, it wasn't very very successful. Um, and I think that the, the main idea is how the community will have the honesty of uh, of their own issues and, and, and solving it without like intervention from uh, outside, outsiders. So that's, that's something that people come down and, and discuss everything. And we use app because uh, it's more like uh, easy to, to tackle the issues of the community. And, uh, and then uh, people like from different, from different generations, they come together and they share the ideas about what they understand and what they, they get out of those uh, art. Um, we did this. And let me just go to the film. And uh, this film is like based on the circle of circles. And uh, we call it that reflection. But also, we can see the many, many, many things about uh, the, the power of the women. And, and, uh, and also, we give us different perspectives for women. Uh, and their, their, their views of how come people like uh, come together and how can they solve the issues. Uh, and also, if you, if you tell you just go uh, listen carefully and watch it, I read the stuff out of the uh, Some women said that, like, uh, at night, and people here, if you, if you, if you, if you, if you walk alone at night, maybe something will happen to you. And this something also can include, like, uh, a sexual environment and school grades. Was like a uh, robbery and all this stuff. So the, the women, I think that they, they need a space. And the sort of certain stuff that they give them the space to the space to express themselves in a very uh, wide way. And uh, let, let, let me let you enjoy the film and we can talk later if you have any questions later. Thank you all. Thank you. I'll play the film. Oops. Just bear with me while I do this. Gone now. Madame Arjunibiro, Little Gacudru, Fusoa, 
Apologies.
Thank you. I think you can see from that uh, film 
just how um, powerful story circles are on many levels. The data that emerged, the insights that emerged were multi-layered um, and really complex in terms of giving us insights into how people navigate their their lives in really challenging um, contexts. But the, the circles themselves, I think, can see from those reflections offered space, a safe space for different groups to explore um, some of the challenges, but also some of the positive aspects of their, um, their lives. So we're going to turn now, we've, we've outlined the method, the way that we um, approached gathering um, our insights. We're now going to turn to present what we see as some of the key findings. There's a richness that we've not yet fully um, unearthed in the, in the data, but there was one particularly striking and strong narrative that came out um, around gender, but also the contradictions um, around uh, images of gender equality set against images of, of high levels of gender inequality and violence against women and girls. Prevalence levels, um, of violence are, are really incredibly high in um, South Sudan. But actually these statistics don't tell us the whole story. Gender and gendered relationships are far more complex um, than the statistics allow us to understand. Story circles have enabled us to really explore the intersection between cultural practices and then gendered ideologies that are ultimately patriarchal and arguably um, feed an environment in which violence is normalized. So I'm going to invite uh, my colleague Louis Netta to present his um, animation, which very powerfully um, presents the, the narrative that emerged from many of the story circles. So Louis, I'm going to hand over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I think Atem's um, video puts it really nicely in the sense um, that art is kind of is joy. Art gives people um, uh, a sense of purpose um, and you know, commerce, a way of making a living, and so forth. But but that fundamentally, that also art is a um, conversation. It promotes dialogue, and it is a sort of dialogue unto itself. And in my approach to making this animation, was using a mix of styles to explore a kind of non-linear sense of um, the lived experience of people on the ground, um, which is diverse. It isn't a singular instance. There's no singular way of experiencing um, violence or joy or artistic practices and complexity. So the use of lots of different ways of making the animation um, was an intentional way to show um, the diversity of kind of artistic practice, but also the diversity of experience within that. So without further ado, um, yeah, to take a look at the video, which yeah, explores, tries, in, well, intends to kind of encapsulate some of the key themes that developed from Tamsin's research. You might have to reshare though, because um, that might go to a separate screen. Is it coming through? No, I think you might have to, you have to kind of close this and then open the Vimeo, yeah, sorry. So if you if you stop the share and then just oh, it, yeah, there you go. have I done it now? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. All right. Sorry. Hang on. It's a little bit low, though. Low. South Sudan society is highly gendered, with men okay. at the heart. Bride price is central to the process of marriage, but involves a bride being bought by her prospective husband. This unhelpfully brings inequality into their relationships from the start and often leads to men feeling like they own their wives. Ownership sanctions the use of violence Intimate partner violence is very high in South Sudan. Conflict, displacement, resettlement, and struggle 
South Sudan is a new country with old problems. War and its aftermath shapes the country today. A fragile state navigates its future. The stress of war brings stress into households which tips over into violence. Women in conflict settings are often left alone as husbands have gone to war or been killed. They have to find ways to feed their children and keep going. People are displaced and families are uprooted. What survives, however, are artistic practices that have been passed down for generations that bring joy to many, not just those who make it. Art represents an expressive outlet for women and men, providing needed escape, resilience, and commerce. The making of Milaya bedsheets offers women financial independence, self-worth, and escapism. The sisterhood of women is knitted into every piece of the Milaya made by women for women. Yet the sheets are sold as part of bride price, the very practice that embeds gender inequalities. The bed sheet brings love, joy, financial independence, but also reinforces a tradition that results in women being owned. The love and pride passed on through the bedsheet is powerful and enduring. But the harsh realities of a new life can shatter comfortable notions of happiness, mutual respect, and dignity. Men do, however, show respect for women through song and tradition. These romantic songs show great love and admiration for women, songs of happy times. Conflict has shattered normality and these dangerous fractures have brought violence in the home. Through art, however, men and women work side by side, bonded by tradition and commerce. Violence looms, however, and this dynamic is fragile. And Bride Price still plays a role in perpetuating negative gender perceptions. And yet empowerment in the form of tradition, pride and income come with the making of Milaya bedsheets. Men too find the same in wood carving and working on baskets alongside women. With every new bedsheet and basket, a new story is being forged. A story that starts with hope and love, with positive industry. A complex practice that is balanced between the positive and negative. Fundamentally, artistic practices build resilience and manifest hope. go back to the um, PowerPoint. Thank you. I don't know if you want to follow up, Louis, with anything. No, uh, not necessarily. I think that's, uh, that's probably enough other than, yeah, it was a really interesting project to work on. And I think it's just incredible to see um, how diverse the artistic practices in South Sudan are. I think that was, and I think it's an important message to kind of get out there. And also this kind of duality that exists, um, which is very much the focus of the animation. It uh, looks like Cressida has a question. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, hand, I'll hand back to those that are facilitating the discussion now. 
Thank you. Thank you, Louis. Uh, I'm just... Um, Cressida has a question, John. Maybe start with, with her. Cressida, would you like to come in with your question? Yeah, uh, amazing animation, Louis. I just wonder if you've had a chance yet to um, show the community in Juba the animation and um, if, if they've evaluated it and what they're uh, um, reacting. No, but hopefully Tamsin and Atem and Rebecca and James, we can sort something out. I think that would be very valuable, obviously. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, COVID's rather stopped us in our tracks because that absolutely is the next, um, the next stage. We, we, we plan many things. We plan an art festival actually in Juba. We plan a number of workshops in which artists come together to, um, to share their skills. Um, so there's a lot more work that we that we need to do under this um, project, but yeah, absolutely, that kind of reciprocal process is really important. And also, just to be clear, all of the data is made possible because of a team of brilliant researchers, two of whom I know I'm, are sat with Atem and um, Rebecca today, and it's really their skill and commitment that's given us this material. So we have a many more um, outputs. That are, that are planned that really um, involve the, the team who are responsible for, for collecting the data. We have uh, one question uh, from Vishnu, who's interested to get a rough idea of what it costs to make animations, Louis, because he thinks it can be a, a great tool where we, as in his words, cannot expose the victim. Yeah, I think, I think that I think that's absolutely true. I think animation is particularly well suited for sensitive subjects, and I think also complex subjects. Um, uh, animation does a good job of uh, a bit like the comic as well of unpicking um, co complex issues um, for a wider audience, but also you know for um, uh, for a specialist audience as well. But in terms of the expense of animation, I almost kind of laugh because <laughs> this, kind of, this animation took a very very long time to make. Um, um, but it is, it is costly. However, I think um, doing animation is about um, some connecting with other specialists. I think um, uh, Big Blue um, and Sajid would probably also um, come into this. Um, there are ways of, of doing animation which are a little bit more um, cost effective. Um, but I think in I, one of my interests would be to really start to train people um, in um, in country and really try to enable um, local people to take their hands to animation and comic making um, so that you know they can be t part of the total um, the, the the total package in terms of communicating um, their own stories um, and the, the the stories of their communities. So that would be my ultimate goal. But yes, it is quite costly to make. Um, I'm I'm an employee of the University of Portsmouth, so I'm not getting individually paid to make this particular animation. But um, I have worked in professional animation, and it is it is a fairly costly thing to commission. Um, I won't give you the details unless you want to contact me directly. Um, but I'll put my email uh, down. Thank you, Louis. I think we'll have to have like a private message to you from Vishnu then on that. Um, there's a couple of messages. I don't think there are questions. I think there's an appreciation of um, how communication uh, through art can be very powerful. And um, comment from Likakiri saying, thank you, Louis. I think that in the multimedia ethnic society like South Sudan, this kind of animation can be highly appreciated. Um, is there any other question? Does anybody want to dive in or otherwise we'll pick up more messages? I'm kind of conscious of time, Tanzin. Uh, I think we're running about 15 minutes behind. I don't know whether you want to stick with the existing running order or bring in our guest researchers and hold back the presentation I'm doing yeah. with Sarah. John, I'll just, um, I'll just reach out in case our uh, team in, in Juba have anything more they want to ask? If not, I suggest we move on to the next um, presentation. Okay. So if, if we met, yes, Rebecca. No, I think, I think we're okay. I just wanted to say, I think we're okay. Everybody, um, really appreciate it. 
Okay. Well, just to say, watch this space because we will be over the coming months developing uh, many more outputs in connection to this project and they will all be showcased um, on gender focus. So let me take you now from South Sudan um, to Nepal. And I will hand over to Samira and uh, John for their presentation on, again, another uh, really innovative research methodology that's allowed us to explore um, a very difficult uh, topic once more. So I'll hand over to John and Samira. Thank you, Tamsin. Um, uh, Tamsin, Samira and myself are going to present. I'll start uh, just by giving some background uh, in the first couple of slides and then hand over to Samira. Um, and again, we're very grateful to be involved in uh, this gender focused launch and to be able to share some of our experience with everyone. Um, the background on this um, relates to a project that we were doing with Tamsin's team called Women, Displacement and Violence, which was focused on research in both Nepal and Myanmar. And um, what we were looking at uh, was sort of environmental um, induced displacement. Um, in Myanmar, we were looking at um, a field site that was located near to a, a village in the centre of the country where there was a lot of uh, flooding and erosion and people got displaced from their homes. They were living just adjacent to the Irwadi River. In Nepal, which we're focusing on in this presentation, um, we had two field sites. Um, in the south of the country, known as the Terai, where there's the border with India, uh, there's a lot of regular annual flooding um, around a city called uh, Biratnagar in Morang district. Um, and people were being displaced again from their, from their homes uh, pretty much on an annual basis because these were major floods. Um, and the second site we focused on goes back to the time of the 2015 earthquake that um, people may recall. There was a really serious um, two earthquakes actually in Nepal that year. And one of them um, caused significant um, disruption and displacement uh, in an area just outside of Kathmandu on the edge of the Kathmandu Valley um, called Shankarapur. And people were displaced from there. Um, you know, Hundreds of thousands of, of houses were basically rendered um, in a condition where people just couldn't live in them. So they're in temporary dwellings and um, not necessarily moved far away, uh, but they uh, couldn't safely live in their houses anymore. And I think this is just an important thing to highlight ab about the nature of displacement um, in both field sites, actually. People were not being displaced uh, from their community to somewhere hundreds of miles away or to a different country. Uh, they were often um, moving maybe a kilometre away or somewhere fairly adjacent to the community that they'd been part of. Um, but they were out of their homes, they were living in temporary shelters or tents for periods of time. And so their situation was quite different. And we wanted to explore the relationship between these environmental catastrophes and the experience of violence uh, that people in those communities faced. Um, so if we can move on to the next slide, please, uh, Tamsin. Yeah, I think it, <laughs> it's frozen again. I might have to do what I did before and come out, come back in again. Sorry, okay. excuse me. Uh, just to say, Samira said she's having internet problems. So um, you may have to carry on, but let's see. Okay, let's see if this works. Oh, nope. Okay. Okay. Sorry, it ruins the flow, doesn't it? The <laughs> presentation when this happens. <laughs> While you're... Um... There we are. Right, I've got to. Um, so I've described the background and the context for the project and now I want to talk a little bit about the origins of the approach that we took. Um, so you know, the project um, had a focus on quantitative and qualitative research and so those methods were applied. Um, 
but we were also looking to get a deeper understanding of what was going on in the community. And that couldn't simply be done by sort of at a point in time um, visits and surveys. Um, we wanted to get an understanding of what happened in the community um, due to seasonal factors, um, the places where there was kind of repeats of flooding and, um, and environmental problems. We need to pick up on how those factors continued to influence potentially what violence was arising. And we also wanted to be aware of what kind of interventions were going on in the community to respond uh, to the displacement and also to the uh, gender-based violence. Um, and obviously those in interventions, whether they're led by government or NGOs, um, changed over time. Um, and uh, there were different gaps from the community's perspective in terms of um, what their needs were and how they were being addressed. Um, so we really wanted to get a sense of the community voice and have this influence the ongoing research and design. And from my perspective, because my focus was on research uptake all the time, I want to see how we could um, create dialogue with the community in order to develop further impact and you know, not wait till the findings of a study have come through. Um, but through interaction as the studies progressed, we wanted to develop these channels for feeding back findings to the community and also to the wider stakeholder groups, um, the organizations involved in interventions with the community and um, the community-based organizations uh, as well. And um, finally, we wanted to uh, look at barriers and constraints that needed to be addressed. Um, so, you know, it wasn't possible for us as a project team to be making regular visits to the, the community. Uh, and certainly over the last um, year or more with COVID, it's um, proved all, even more challenging. Um, for an international team, there are language barriers. Um, it's very difficult to fully understand uh, different cultures unless you've lived there uh, for a long time. So there's, there's all those issues of how to build trust and relationships. And given the nature of the research, looking at these sensitive areas again around uh, violence, um, these aspects of trust and relationships are, are very important. And you know, some of our other approaches to research can be seen as extractive. People are not necessarily um, feeling that open to, to what's going on. Um, so we really wanted to build this connection with the community. Now, um, I hope I can hand over to Samira at this point, but <laughs> I don't know whether you've got an update on her connectivity. Otherwise, I'll do my best to um, go through the next sli slides on her behalf. Do you know uh, Tamsin if Samira is there? She hasn't. Uh, she hasn't messaged. I don't know. Samira, can you hear us? I think maybe carry on, John. Okay. Well, if we can move to the next slide, uh, and I should just say by way of introduction, uh, Samira Shrestha is um, uh, a key team member uh, located in Kathmandu, who's uh, been working with um, the. Um, projects again. Uh, I think we're going back to in and out of the slides again here. Yeah, <laughs> so um, she works with um, a, whoops, <laughs> it's flying around in front work. of me. Going to work. <laughs> um, yeah, she, she's very much connected with the um, community of NGOs and international organizations and women's group movements in Nepal. Uh, and she also has her own kind of organization that does consultancy. Um, she's been working as a, a key researcher, looking at the qualitative side of the studies um, of the work being done. Uh, and has been involved in a few of our projects that um, Tamsin and I have been working on. Um, are we able to get back to the slides, Tamsin? Yeah. Is it I gone? think I've solved it. Hopefully. Okay. Right. Is this this is is this where we were up to? Uh, yes. Thank you. Um, so we may or may not be able to get Samira back, but I hope that she'll be back in time for any questions that people want to raise at the beginning, um, because she's been the key person in terms of how this approach worked in practice. Um, she, through her relationships that she built with the communities and obviously speaking um, Nepali language and everything, was able to select the right people 
and provide them with training and induction. Uh, we were calling these people, for want of a better title, displacement narrators, people who could tell the story of what was happening in their community. But they were, as I said, more than narrating what was happening, they were also interacting and building trust and making a, a really significant bridge between the research team and what was going on in the community so that they could also be part of that research process, learn from what was going on and feedback some of the findings and uh, recommendations um, and discuss them within their community. So what we introduced via Samira was regular conversations where possible, um, she was visiting the community and talking to them and uh, learning from them. Um, where that was not possible, it was done by phone. Um, the narrators were documenting um, observations and um, Samira through her conversations with them was uh, documenting this. And um, in the beginning, we were getting a lot of really quite disturbing case stories. Um, I think that really kind of brought through the reality of some of the nature of violence that was happening. Um, but um, we, over time, sort of also really felt that it, it wasn't that that we wanted to know about all the time. We wanted to get an understanding um, of uh, what was happening, what responses were available and how things may or may not have been changing in the community over time. Um, so uh, what was being done here was complementing the qualitative approaches to research and enabling us to get some ideas about um, what's happening in the community as it moved uh, from the sort of disaster towards a more normalized situation because the experience of violence potentially was changing over time as, as people got rehabilitated from temporary dwellings to their homes. Um, we then kind of were writing up and sharing uh, the material that had been shared with um, Samira and producing blogs and newsletters and um, you know, informing the research and the research design, but it was also a way of communicating more widely with other stakeholders um, nationally and internationally what was happening. Um, and then there's the feedback. We were producing findings and sharing back these findings um, via Sumira uh, with the narrators and with the community, and they were able to, to share um, the research findings, both in formal and informal meetings and interactions back in their community. Um, and the next slide, which is our final slide. Um, there were a number of challenges uh, in doing this. If Sumia is back, she's best placed to sort of give a, a, a kind of sense of the reality of this. Um, otherwise, I'll have a go. Is Samira back with us? I'm not sure. Samira, are you there? Can you hear us? Okay, uh, I will uh, continue then, uh, <laughs> we'll do our best with this. Um, so, you know, one of the challenges is finding the right people. These people need to be sensitive and trusted within their community. Um, so it's important that they understand the purpose of their role and that they can build trust themselves with the community. Um, linking back to some of the earlier questions about the sensitivity of the topics being discussed, um, I think there's also lots of support and training and um, thinking about how to uh, deal uh, with the ethics and uh, respond to di disturbing cases um, that may arise in the community that the narrators become familiar with. Um, as we develop the, the tool, we kind of also tried to create more of a structure around it um, so that each month we were asking and exploring similar questions that over time we could look at from that sort of more longitudinal basis. Um, and Samir has highlighted the COVID-19 pandemic as a, uh, a particular uh, challenge over the last um, year or more. And this obviously has constrained travel. Uh, it's introduced a new factor that affects everybody in both of those communities in terms of their experience potentially of violence as well. It just adds another um, major layer uh, on top of the environmental displacement that people are already experiencing. Um, so I'm gonna stop there. I don't know whether Tamsin, you want to uh, add anything to, to what I've said on um, Samira's behalf. Um, um, just, to, just, to, just to flag, I mean, this, um, 
technique that was developed as part of this particular project has actually been used and taken up by a number of other projects, including I know we have our um, research team from uh, Bangladesh on the on the line also in Bangladesh and India um, to track the impact of COVID-19 on workers within uh, modern slavery sectors, particularly for University of Portsmouth, it was to focus on the impact of COVID on workers within the ready-made garment sector. It, it proved to be really useful during a time when face-to-face -face data collection just is not um, possible and it enables us to get that as John's um, articulated that change over time how people's lives have changed and in context of extreme disaster and trauma that COVID has brought to many vulnerable communities it's just been really helpful to be able to give voice give stories of um, of people on the ground who are really bearing the brunt um, of what's going on and highlight in relation to the garment sector the huge inequalities um, and discrimination that vulnerable communities face. Um, and that work has been really beneficial to the SCDO um, in developing and reflecting on their modern slavery portfolio. So just to say that as a technique, it, it's now being taken up and used across a number of projects, all of which are showcased on gender focus. So I'll stop there and see if there are any, any other questions. Uh, I think we might have to move back so she might be able to pick up on questions as well. Are you there Shanira? Maybe not. Um, if there's any questions then I'm not seeing any in the chat window at this point. We can maybe come back at the end. Yes it may be when someone is back with us it would be good to see if there are other questions at that point. Yeah. Great. So thank you to project teams for presenting um, your work. We are now going to move into um, our third section segment in which we invite a number of PhD students to share with us um, their work. I always find hearing from PhD students particularly exciting because the work that they do is uh, usually very innovative and really pushing the boundaries of how we think about these um, issues. So it's in no particular order, um, but Georgia, your, your slides are first. So if I can invite you, um, please, to, to speak to them. So Okay. Hi, can you hear me? I'm yeah. Hi, thanks so much to all the other um, presentations. They've been really, really interesting. And thank you, Tamsin, for giving us a platform to talk about our work as early career uh, researchers. Uh, so my name is Georgia Hales. Um, I'm at the University of Leeds. And I'm in my first year of a four-year PhD, so I'm just in the process of developing my project proposal for them this year. Um, so I want, I'm wanting to look at the role that gender plays in um, menstrual hygiene management services in humanitarian settings. Um, so as you probably know, um, inadequate access to appropriate menstrual hygiene management services is a global gendered issue. So what constitutes a, an appropriate service would be um, adequate water and sanitation facilities, um, access to appropriate materials to manage one's period, and also education about menstruation and how to, and how to manage one's period. Um, so access to these things are exacerbated in humanitarian settings. Uh, and of course, uh, managing one's period can be a very individual and cultural process. So participation is often necessary with end users in order to create uh, culturally appropriate solutions. However, participation, uh, options for participation either doesn't really exist in these settings or there are barriers um, to, to women wanting to participate. Next slide, please. Oh. <laughs> I had another slide after this one. Is it not included? Doesn't look like it. Sorry. Oh no. <laughs> um, I can just talk a little bit about it. it. Doesn't really matter. I think I remember what was on it. Um, so I'm wanting to look at the different levels um, on the socio-ecological scale of what the barriers might be. Um, so the first would be to look at what individuals perceive as gendered barriers to participating in um, the design of menstrual hygiene services. Um, so this might be um, childcare constraints or um, restrictions um, that their partner puts on them 
or in um, either worst cases, um, violence from the partner um, surrounding participation. Um, then on the kind of the next level would be the interpersonal level. So looking at what the male perceptions of menstrual hygiene and female participation within these uh, projects uh, might look like and a kind of deeper analysis of, of how this acts as a barrier. Uh, and then on the, the wider level, the organizational level, how gender diversity within um, kind of camp management teams might impact um, the ability for there to be uh, menstrual hygiene services and participatory services. Um, so my end uh, idea of what the research might look like um, will be a kind of scale of female participations uh, from high to low and then on, on the bottom, um, the level of gender diversity within camp management. Um, and the scale will kind of go from one end of being no participation opportunities um, to them perhaps suggesting that with more gender diverse teams, there's more options for menstrual uh, hygiene management programs and, and options for participation. So that, that uh, leads to high levels of um, female participation. But then uh, we get to a point where uh, the level of gender diversity doesn't matter because um, the number of barriers are um, outweighed by the positives of participating. Um, and so women may end up not participating in these projects, um, which, yeah may lead to inappropriate uh, design of solutions. That's it from me, thanks. Thank you, Georgia, and apologies for missing- That's up. okay, no worries. <laughs> um, just to open up, I, I mean, I do actually have, I don't know if it's a question or a reflection, um, but I'll, I'll hold back for a moment and just see if there's um, anything that's come through in the, in the chat. John, are you able to check for us? Lost John now. Sorry, I <laughs> lost my um, mute button briefly. Um, there's nothing specifically in the chat, um, but if anybody um, wants to dive in, uh, please do. So my reflection, Georgia, was really, it's really, I mean, your research is obviously really, really uh, important and critical. And I just, um, I'm always, shocked um, by how little attention is given to this issue within humanitarian crises. And I can see links actually between um, exclusion on the base of lack of menstrual hygiene and um, gender-based violence. I mean, I think the, the level of kind of exclusion that we see um, can almost be classed as a form of um, violence. And I think when we uh, come on, I know Patience is gonna be talking and a bit about her research that's looking at how to mainstream um, across different sectors of development. And I think there's a real possibility, a real need, if you like, for really integrating and thinking through um, gender in a, I mean, we've had gender mainstream for a while, but really integrating a gendered, a critical gendered perspective through projects. And I think the humanitarian um, sector really highlights that more than more than most, and we certainly have seen it in our research on displacement, that of course displacement is going to trigger violence, um, but yet it's not um, reflected in, in programming. So I think that was a reflection rather than a question, Georgia, but thank you. Really, really fascinating um, study. And I'll stop there in case there's anyone else who wants to speak, otherwise we'll move on and leave some time at the end for, for joint discussion. Does anybody want to dive in? No, uh, there is just a comment from uh, Dr. Angela Crack that my, her friend Sarah, Sarah Parker does some similar work. And there's a link in the chat window uh, about that if you want to connect. Uh, so back to you, Tamsin, for the next presentation. So can I invite Ruth, please, also a PhD student at the University of Leeds to prevent, present your uh, research. Hopefully I've got all your slides, Ruth. Hi, yes. Um, yeah, thanks, Tamsin. Um, and Georgia. So yeah, I'm uh, Ruth, I'm in the same position as Georgia, so I'm a first year um, PhD student at the University of Leeds, and um, the title for my research is Advancing Gender in the Wash Sector, an Intersectional Approach to Service Inequalities. Um, so I've kind of identified two problems, 
that I'm looking to address in my research. Um, the first is the immediate situation of um, kind of inequalities in wash services in certain areas in the global south. Um, particularly, I'm interested in urbanising environments. So I'm looking at why some areas of cities are well served and other areas are particularly poorly served with water and sanitation services. Um, particularly low income uh, urban settings or informal settlements are often informally served. Um, and yeah, they don't, don't have good access to water and sanitation. And this is a well-known um, human rights issue um, as the UN recognized the right to water and sanitation um, in 2010. Um, and often these communities are affected by overlapping disadvantages um, and often the lack of wash um, access is kind of a symptom of more structural um, inequalities and disadvantages. Um, for example, often kind of migrant communities, uh, the rural poor um, who have moved to urban areas and a um, large portion of female headed households reside in kind of poor urban settings. And so therefore their realities are intersectional and their experiences of wash um, inequalities are intersectional. Um, and this is where intersectionality sort of comes in um, to my research and the wash sector generally doesn't um, do much in the in the space of intersectionality research. Um, there's a lot of kind of gender mainstreaming in wash um, and it's gender and wash has followed the general sort of progression of gender and development. Um, but a lot of the kind of critiques of gender and development also apply quite strongly to the wash sector in that conceptualization of gender is very Western um, and based on kind of Western feminist and capitalist ideals in terms of sort of empowering individual women for economic productivity. And um, a lot of the kind of claims that WASH automatically empowers women, um, I believe are not well substantiated. Um, and yeah, I think there's an absence of some critical voices in the sector on gender. Um, so that's another problem. I'd like to address in my research. Um, I don't know if there's another slide, Tamsin. Yeah. So just briefly, um, my approach to my research um, will kind of be based on intersectionality theory in that it has a component of kind of lived realities, lived experiences of people in these urban settings um, who don't have good access to wash. And um, so I'll be doing some ethnographic case studies using um, participatory video methods. Um, to try and present and kind of capture the, the real experiences of people with their overlapping um, social identities in, in their lack of access to WASH. And then I'll conduct some kind of structural systems analysis um, of services to try and identify the structural drivers of inequalities um, and then combine these two um, types of study to uh, present some kind of uh, locally informed solutions and to improving kind of equity of services. So, thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Um, again, John, if you can highlight any um, any questions in the chat box, I just have a reflection, Ruth. Um, you've really, you know, brought to light. Uh, I think both of you have actually, Georgia, too. The kind of the gaps um, in understanding in terms of how um, wash issues intersects with intersect with multiple other um, issues in terms of not just gender, but also age, disability, ethnicity, just where you are, you know, resource um, access, and so on, and issues of power. So I like, you know, the combination of that intersectional approach with the political economy lens, ethnographic research we know allows us to get that really deep, rich um, insight. And also just to note that Georgia was applying the the ecological model, which again, I think is a really um, powerful tool to understand structural gender inequalities, which are at the heart of the problem. And we can see those structural gender inequalities um, reflected also in how development programming gets put together, because these issues of power and exclusion are not fully integrated in how, for example, the WASH sector approaches it programming. So I'll stop there and ask John if there's any other comments or questions in the chat box. In the chat box, uh, I think there's some uh, people sort of suggesting ways for um, connecting with others. Uh, so uh, Rajkumari Dura has suggested that 
checking with Days for Girls International. I think she's referring that comment to Sarah. Um, Vishnu uh, from Nepal has uh, put a challenge for you, Ruth and Georgia here. She says, congratulations on your presentations. They're excellent. Um, and what's your future plan to engage in gender and women related research in South Asia? So I think he's encouraging you to look in that direction. And I'm sure if you do, he'd be of great um, help to you. Um, I don't know if you have any future plan uh, for that, but <laughs> that's a comment there from Vishnu for you. Um, there's no other specific questions. So I, I don't know if anyone wants to respond to Vishnu or if we move on. Shall we hold that question? Um, and move on to Hannah. I'm just conscious of time and, and Vishnu is chairing our final session. So I'm, I'm sure he can, uh, can summarize and invite a comment at that point, if that's okay. So I'll invite Hannah, please, um, to, to present your, your PhD work. Thank you. So um, as Georgia and Ruth said, thank you Tamsin for inviting us. It's really exciting to kind of show my research plan with such an interesting audience. So I'm Hannah and I work with Georgia and Ruth do my PhD in civil engineering at the University of Leeds. And so my project is going to be about how we make sanitation facilities, so predominantly toilets and latrines, more gender inclusive, with direct reference to how we make gender guidelines easier to use. So globally, we know there are countless sanitation facilities that are inappropriate for use, and this may, may be due to the exclusion of fittings such as clean water taps inside toilet blocks or places of disposed menstrual items. Perhaps facilities are poorly maintained, leaning to unpleasant, unhygienic facilities. There may be a lack of privacy and safety due to lack of locks and lighting. And sometimes they may just be poorly designed for the needs of today's. So for some people, trying to use a squatting toilet in trousers is rather difficult. So all of these issues have inherent gendered elements. So some may influence decisions around how to manage menstruation, and some may have consequences that lead to increased instances of gender-based violence per se. So the good news is that we know tens of guidelines exist that aim to make sanitation more inclusive. Yet we also know regardless of the introduction and circulation of these documents, that sanitation facilities continue to be built without gender considerations in mind. And in order to understand how we make sanitation facilities more inclusive, we need to ask several questions. So why are guidelines not university, universally used? Documents such as these have been in circulation for over two decades. And why are we still building inappropriate toilets? Is it lack of country level policy, lack of enforcement? lack of incentives and fundings to build more than what's considered basic needs. Perhaps it's just that gender considerations such as menstrual disposal options are not considered essential when it comes to planning. And what are basic needs and what's labeled as optional? So there's a history of gender considerations being additional and added extra and not essential in sanitation considerations. So only by challenging these preconceptions can we hope to create safe and appropriate sanitation spaces that encapsulate gendered needs? Uh, next slide, please. So in order to answer these questions, I'm planning on writing four papers to kind of understand this theme. So the first is going to be an analysis of how gender has historically been included in international development projects. And only by establishing patterns, misconceptions, issues, but also instances of good practice, can we understand how gender is conceptualized and integrated into these projects. I'll then look at gender guidelines for WASH by assessing their content, use, and design. Hopefully, I'll be able to interview some key informants to understand how these documents are used in practice, how and why they're designed, in order to understand what are the issues preventing their incorporation? Paper three is then going to address this direct issue, following on that guidelines are designed to be cross context and therefore are often too vague to provide insight for practitioners. So this study will most likely look at designing a methodology of how we identify and rank gendered community sanitation needs, but is still kind of 
in the process of being finalised due to changing coronavirus situation and available field work. And then finally, I'm hoping to link all these together to create a conceptual model. And so this is going to highlight all the factors that feed into successful guideline uptake and usage. So by understanding how enforcement, local power dynamics, patriarchal societies, funding and many other elements tie into guideline policy guidelines, we can seek to help use them better in local contexts. So currently, these documents often stand alone and by explicitly stating the context in which they work, I hope to be able to provide information on how to best implement these documents moving forward to ensure more gender inclusive facilities. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Again, really, really important, critical questions that you're asking. I find it really refreshing that these questions are, are being asked. I think you're really um, challenging now the sector because we have had gender mainstream for quite some time. Um, and those of us that work or approach gender from a feminist perspective continue to be frustrated that it's not, uh, it's not applied in a particularly transformative way. And I think your research is really asking the question, why, why is it not? What are the barriers? Um, and those barriers might lie at a country level, uh, but I think there are also really important questions that need to be asked of the development sector itself. Questions around whether or not we are really, really committed to, it, to being inclusive or if we're still just playing lip service to that. So thank you, really, um, really great work that I shall be following now. And hopefully Gender Focus will give you a, a, a platform to be able to, to get your research out to a wider audience because it's clearly really important. John, again, are there any questions or comments in the, in the chat box before we go to the last um, presentation? Uh, yes, quickly, there's a comment from Samira who's back with us, uh, which is good to, good to know. Um, she thinks these are very important questions regarding barriers, especially linked to inclusion. And, so as a big thank you to Hannah and Vishnu has got another question that so I don't know if we want to take this one now or not but um, he's asking did you also look at the gender composition of the international development agencies or only the international development projects? So currently I've looked at international development projects only so looking at kind of how gender is incorporated actually understanding how those roles play out on the ground. And um, I haven't looked at the composition of the agencies, but actually maybe George and Ruth can put in the chat, but they did some work a little while ago on kind of the, the makeup of agencies and organizations and kind of the, yeah, the gender. I mean, they can, they can talk about it, it's their piece of work, but they actually did a piece of, works on a similar tangent to that, which I'm sure they could signpost, which would be interesting for you to read. Thank you very much, Hannah. So do continue um, to exchange uh, messages in the chat window over that. And um, I think there's some interesting connections with South Asia being thought about already there. So <laughs> that's good to see. Um, so thank you and back to Tamsin. Thank you. Um, so we move to the last presentation uh, from a PhD student, which is from Patients who is in her second year at, uh, at Portsmouth and she is an ESRC funded student. So Patience, I'm gonna hand over to you. Thanks, Tamsin. Um, so thank you for the platform once again. And also thanks everyone and hello. Um, I'm a second year PhD student of Tamsin's and uh, my, the title of my research is monitoring and evaluating the impact of mainstreaming violence against women and girls, including FGM. In, HIV program. And so for the context, um, I'm working in the border region between South Africa and Zimbabwe. This is where uh, the Venda region where you find uh, a Venda ethnic uh, group both within South Africa and Zimbabwe. And so within uh, that group, there is a high prevalence. Uh, this is generally in South Africa and Zimbabwe, high prevalence of HIV and GBV and FGM uh, labia elongation in particular that's type 4 FGM. So um, labia elongation is widespread mostly in Zimbabwe and it's also documented uh, within the Venda region of South Africa. So it is taught in initi initiation schools uh, as part of the initiation rites for girls coming into 
womanhood. So girls are taught uh, subservience and gendered roles are also taught and reinforced uh, within the initiation schools. And so these socialized gender norms, they bring out a gender ideology that renders uh, women inferior, which increases their vulnerability. So FGM is therefore essentially a mechanism for reinforcing vulnerability and inferiority, which triggers other forms of uh, violence specifically. HIV. FGM is also linked to other forms of violence such as bride price and uh, child rape. So there is a robust HIV program in, in both South Africa and Zimbabwe. There is a GBV programming as well, although because of funding issues, um, other issues take precedence uh, over GBV according to the government uh, government's priorities. So FGM is not recognized as an issue and therefore it's not included uh, in any programming. And uh, I argue that it should. And so, um, okay, oh, you're there already. I was gonna say next slide. And so my research is now exploring these links between HIV, um, I can't see the rest of this because I'll use this one. So between HIV and other forms of violence with the potential to argue for a more holistic um, and mainstream approach to programming so that all opportunities are maximized uh, to end a violence in all its forms. Literature is limited that links these three issues and uh, so is the literature that also um, mentions any programming at all. So what you find with programming is that uh, the practitioners tend to go in with a single focus without understanding the underlying issues and how these may be connected or linked, which means then that uh, either a one size fits all approach is used in different contexts where they may not be appropriate uh, when uh, these issues could be more uh, research or at a very basic level, the root level, to find out what really is then leading into these issues um, where women's vulnerabilities are exacerbated. And so understanding the links is important in challenging those um, gender inequalities, which also underpin and fuel violence and especially HIV transmission. Mainstreaming these issues will also help in reducing and ending violence against women and girls. And so I aim to understand the links between those different forms. Next slide, Tamsin, those different forms of uh, violence, including HIV transmission. So it's also to understand mainly the cultural norms that lead to the normalization of such forms of violence to the extent that they are not even regarded as harmful. And if they are regarded as harmful, Orders and what, uh, what what's done about it. So this is mainly also with um, the programmers themselves, including their stakeholders, just finding out whether they um, re recognize and acknowledge this. So I also need to understand those specific norms that actually underpin you know women's uh, vulnerability, and also what could be that trigger point of really reversing those norms and having people changing hearts. So the primary objective is really to inform an effective mainstreaming approach so that our programmers then come in with interventions that are tailored uh, to the problems at hand, mostly the mainstreaming of all of the problems and therefore reducing uh, violence against women and girls. So. I hope to design other two, the mainstreaming tool, and also to test it out and see how easy it might be to use. Um, um, and um, also whether you know, we can use it across the development sectors for different uh, programs, not just those on violence, but also even including WASH or any food programs, mini development projects. Um, so for the participants themselves, so I will use um, a qualitative approach, semi-structured interviews with uh, the development practitioners and their stakeholders, mainly to find out whether they themselves do see these links and what they think about linking health messages around harmful cultural practices within um, project uh, development. And I'll also be speaking to teachers uh, looking to see whether these initiation rights could be also be 
including FGM could be included within the education uh, curriculum and whether it's being taught already or how much is being taught. And also I'll be speaking to women's action groups because these um, grassroots groups that work with the women, they see the problems. And that's again, another thing to see how much they see of the links themselves, whether they are making these links. Also to find out which interventions they think work um, for domestic violence victims and how effective they are or they have been and what could be more effective. I'll also be speaking to um, vulnerable individuals individually as well as in uh, focus groups. Uh, also to find out mainly the desirability of FGM itself, why, um, why it's continuing and also to just find out what challenges women are facing as they access uh, uh, health uh, and well-being services. Um, thank you. Thank you, Patience. I think listening um, to you after the, uh, your uh, colleagues before, it's, it's really clear that there are strong um, overlap, but also you know, somebody that's worked within gender and development for decades, um, I feel that there is even more of an urgency for us to be asking exactly the critical questions all four of you are, are asking. We still have a long way to go. I feel a, somewhere along the line we've got a bit lost, I think, because gender as a concept almost got co-opted, um, but it got co-opted in an instrumental way, so it lost its kind of political and radical edge. You know, gender as a lens is really a way of us understanding how power operates and how power operates to marginalize certain groups and make them and render them vulnerable to um, to forms of violence and exclusion. So, you know, I think listening to all of you together, I can see quite strong overlaps and I can see an urgency in terms of us looking more closely at how to link different development and um, themes and, and issues, but also to push for this much more critical lens and approach. So I'll stop there, John, are there any comments before we need to hand over to Bishnu for the final wrapping up? Um, well, there's positive feedback from different people to on these presentations, which is great to see. Please um, pick up on those comments, those who've been presenting, because uh, everybody's very appreciative. Um, and then there's a comment from Samira, so, who um, notes that there's a nice concept of linking these three broader topics, and it's very interesting. And she believes this will add some literature to these understudied areas. She asks, what specific violence against women are you looking into as the other two topics are specific compared to this? Um, so I'm assuming that's a, a question to patients. Is that right, Samira? I think, anyway, that's, um, uh, so I don't know, um, Tamsin, if you want that question to be picked up on now or we um, continue on. Um, I think let's, let's um, continue on. Patients can be thinking about that. Um, I'm just conscious of time, and I'd really like to hand over now to um, Vishnu, who I'll invite to introduce himself, and he's just going to uh, lead us to the final session in which we, we give some reflections in terms of the way forward. So Vishnu, I'll hand over to you. And I don't okay. need to share my screen anymore, which is a relief. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tamshin. Thank you all for attending this very exciting um, short uh, sessions we were organizing. Welcome to the last session, although the only 10, 12 minutes uh, delayed, we will try to be able to finish on time. Um, the presentation uh, today was so exciting and as Pamsin said, it was really a great way to go and so many young scholars coming with such a fantastic idea and question and perspective. So it is really an important uh, issue and also uh, this gender focus is uh, willing to provide that platform for the knowledge sharing and trans transdisciplinary and multidisciplinary type of the work among us. Uh, so, with that very quick background, I invite all the participants to reflect on 
uh, gender focused event and give your suggestions and give your feedback how you want to engage in this process what uh, suggestion you have on the content what suggestion you have on the process how we can uh, expand this as the common platform for the collective uh, aim and concerted action to address this gender discrimination so uh, perhaps for a few minutes the floor is open to give us the constructive feedback and suggestion um, you can also write in the message box so it will also be documented uh, you can share your perspective and Cecilia has already raised the hand so we will start from there and anyone who wants to talk be brief be specific considering the time Cecilia I said, I don't know if it's an old hand, but your hand is still up. Okay, I don't know then. Yeah, sorry, that's an old hand. <laughs> so. Vishnu, it might be worth just using it just to flag up um, events coming, uh, events that are, are looming. Um, if, uh, both the gender focus in terms of the uh, webinar series. Yes, I had the second step if there was, uh, I was waiting for any suggestions, if not, okay. we, have, uh, we want to share some of the points which are possible um, activities of the gender focus, um, probably suitable for all of us who are present in this forum, some of them are, for example, we are planning to have the regular podcast series. Uh, we will have also the webinar, seminar, webinars, and we want to invite all of you and to be an active part of that. And also the email newsletter earlier, uh, John and other colleagues were sharing uh, perhaps online course on the specific gender issue, Tamsin. Uh, one of the leading gender scholar in the world is here. She has such a wide experiences all over the Africa and Asia. So we can uh, capitalize our experience and also perhaps possible collaboration for the future work in terms of writing, publication, joint project, research, dissemination, whatever it is. So these are some of the possible area where we can uh, collaborate together, we can benefit from each other and gender focus uh, with the leadership of Thompson is determined to uh, provide these facilities and uh, it has been expanded from South Asia to the um, wider world. So we are hoping to get more scholars, more scholarly engagement, scholar and practitioner both in fact, that, that's why I was um, using the transdisciplinary uh, world. So anyone interested can join with this uh, bigger network and we can share each other. If there are anything, any comments from anyone, please. I'm just wondering a question, if we can ask a question to our PhD students. Um, put them on the spot and ask them what would what would you at your stage of of career find most useful from gender focus what would be most helpful um hi it's georgia hi georgia um, i think for me at this stage and, and the stage ruth is at as well where we're just developing our phd proposals um I think feedback on our on the kind of design and, and approaches that we're doing would be really um, really important from the kind of the agendaed lens to make sure that we're developing our projects in the right way and the, in the most effective way by people who have had experience in, in the field and in these in these kinds of research projects already. So I mean that's actually something that came to mind, Georgia, just listening to all of the presentations. Um, that I think there's opportunity for us to maybe run a series of discussion groups focused very much on methodology, sharing good practice, um, but also sharing um, research design. And that's certainly something that we can, that we can quite easily um, organize. I might actually um, pass, pass the uh, facilitation of that over, over to um, 
over to, to you with your, your peers. Um, but definitely, I think that's, that's very much what we were hoping gender focus to be able to do is to, is to support the next generation of researchers. So thank you. Yeah, definitely. That sounds amazing. I'm, I'm sure we'd be happy to uh, start facilitating that. Thank you. Great. So I'll be in touch. <laughs> I just want to dive in briefly and just say, you know, today we've been kind of celebrating in a way the, the launch of the website. But the website, as you probably uh, sort of got the picture now, it's very much a platform for creating community. So these newsletters, podcasts, events and things, we'd like to very much work with you if you've got time and you're able to uh, give input, then um, please be in touch with us as to how we can sort of build this with you. Um, there's a lot of content and possibilities, and I think that everyone can benefit the more we build um, momentum and reach and engagement um, around this sort of um, website idea, but as a platform for lots of other ways of um, creating and sharing um, knowledge in, 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 in innovative ways. Sorry, stumbling my words. Vishnu. Pass back to you. Thank you very much. Now I think this time is also very precious to the 12:30, and if there is not much uh, question, I will thank you all, and then I pass to the Tamshin for the closing. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Vishnu. Uh, thank you also for the for the um, high praise and profile rating. I'm not I'm not sure I'd see myself as a <laughs> world leading gender expert, but thank you. I'll take the flattery. Um, so thank you everyone for your participation. I know it's been a long um, stretch, but I think it's been really fascinating. And I hope we've given some insights into the diversity that gender focus um, will, will offer and bring. Um, just to flag a webinars coming up. Uh, next month, we will be hosting a webinar that's looking at the role of animation um, in development. We will also look to create the discussion group that we've just um, spoken of, focus very much on with gendered research and methods and research um, design. And then there'll be a whole host of other um, webinars. So we have um, your contact details. So we will be in touch in terms of advertising those future events, but thank you. More than anything, I need to extend a really huge thank you to, to the team and in particular, um, the team at Big Blue Communications and John, who's been our research uptake uh, lead from the beginning. Thank you so much for all your effort. I know it takes uh, an enormous amount of time to pull together uh, a, a resource that is really interactive and dynamic and very much uh, needed. So thank you all and have a good rest of the day. Or for some of you, it's the, it's the evening now. And as we have to now end um, every session by saying, please stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, all. Bye.